Good to go. Government Operations Committee for Monday, March 22nd is called to order. Uh, anybody have any personal orders? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Representatives Bird, Calfee, Cochran, uh, Crawford, Dixie, Faison, Johnson, Lafferty, Lamar, Littleton, Rudder, Stewart, Warner, Here. Vice Chairman Reedy, Here. Chairman Reagan. Here. Mr. Chairman, you have a quorum. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Members, we have a full calendar today. So since there were no personal observations, I do have to announce some slight changes to our calendar. Uh, at the request of uh, the Dep um, Speaker Pro Tem, we're moving item number 11 to the first position. If you would please refer to item number 11. Do I have a motion? motion? We have a motion and a second. Speaker Pro Tem, you are recognized on your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I really appreciate you moving me up. This, this bill addresses certified medical assistants. Medical assistants currently practice under the supervision of a physician at a physician's owned office, performing whatever task is delegated to them by the medical director. However, certified medical assistants are not allowed to practice in hospital outpatient clinics. What this bill will do will allow certified medical assistants to practice in hospital outpatient clinics. I'd be glad to answer any questions. Members, you've heard the sponsor's explanation. Do we have questions? You're recognized, sir. Representative Stewart, I'm sorry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Is a certified medical assistant, is that is that different from a physician's assistant? Yes, sir. You're recognized, sponsor. It's a totally different type of. Yes. These these medical assistants are are lower level than, than some of the nurses, and they do smaller um, tasks in this it spells out what they can and cannot do in this bill also. You recognize? Thank you for that explanation. I thought that I just wanted to make sure I was understanding the terminology and I appreciate it. Thank you. Do we have other questions? Seeing none, we are voting on sending House, uh, wait a minute, let me get to the, House Bill 559 to calendar and rules. All in favor, indicate by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, nay. Bill moves the calendar rules. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members. And members, we have another shift in our calendar. Uh, item number 19, which is Chairman Helton. Chairman Helton, uh, do we have a motion and a second? We have a motion and a second. Chairman Helton, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members. This is a Tennessee, I mean, this is a treasury bill, and it's a TCRS housekeeping bill. This bill revises provisions governing the state retirement system as follows. Section one and four of the bill amends current law to reflect that federal law recently changed the required minimum distribution age from 70 and a half to 72. Section two of the bill adds language back that was inadvertently deleted in a prior bill, and it is a cleanup change only. Section three amends current law to provide more guidance to political subdivisions joining the hybrid plan as to setting the maximum unfunded liability. This section provides that the maximum unfunded liability may be no greater than 20% of the political subdivision's total pension liability. Section five of the bill amends current law to reflect longstanding TCR practice as to prior service established near the date of retirement. The section provides that for prior service established 30 or more days following the date of retirement, a second benefit is calculated. And section six amends current law to clarify that when members elect to pay for prior service in monthly installments, the payment period may not ex exceed the length of service being established. Members, you've heard the explanations. Do we have questions of the sponsor? Seeing none, we are voting on sending... Uh, Item number 19 on your calendar, 531, House Bill 531 to calendar and rules. All in favor, say, indicate. I'm sorry. Finance, ways and means. Forgive me. We're, we're, <laughs> you, you'd have preferred it the other way, right? 
Thank you. Uh, we're sending it to finest ways and means. Thank you for correcting me there. Uh, all in favor, indicate by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, nay. Ayes have it. Moves out to finance ways and means. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members. All right, members, we're back on the calendar as uh, it's before us. The next item up is House Bill 79 by Chairman Ramsey. And do I have a motion? We have a motion and a second. Chairman Ramsey, you're recognized to explain your bill, sir. And thank you, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, uh, check uh, your mic on there, please, sir. Yes, sir. Thank um, you. One of the positive responsibilities of our regulatory boards is to deter and restrict harmful behavior by licensees that could endanger the public. And, and that's what this bill is about, um, allowing them to do their duty and that uh, keep that responsibility whole. Originally, or uh, now the legislature has um, uh, sought to make TCA 45325 <laughs> a protection under administrative law that would act in the same fashion as Rule 11 of civil procedure, which was passed uh, in 1994 uh, with the uh, uh, intent of uh, as a protection against frivolous and baseless allegations and lawsuits. Uh, the legislative history is clear that the legislature at that time intended this to act as a Rule 11 protection uh, from state agencies bringing frivolous cases. Uh, however, the courts have misinterpreted the language in the statute and stretched the meaning in, in various decisions, which uh, over the past 20 years has, has changed. And the court claimed that the grammatical con construction of the original statute uh, leaves much to be desired. That's, uh, that's in their own words. Uh, so what we're intending to do is uh, 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 let them know that that there is no longer a legislator's lack of response to uh, uh, trying to address these decisions, and uh, they uh, are not so that they're not inclined to interpret the section in a different manner. Um, with that said, um, and uh, with the statement that we are not asking to take the amendment. The, the bill was to be amended, but we want the bill as originally filed. So uh, for further uh, questions or comments, uh, explanations, we have the Department of Health here. If you'd like to go out of session and ask them for particular issues. All right, members, for purposes of clarity, the amendment that was uh, to be considered is no longer at the sponsor's request being considered. Does anyone wish to hear from the Department of Health, for, which referred this bill to us? Okay, we are out of session. Department of Health, please come forward. If you choose, you may remove your mask. Make sure you've got a red light and give us your name and position. Good afternoon, Patrick Powell, Assistant Commissioner for Legislative Affairs at the Department of Health. With me is Mary Catherine Bratton from our Office of General Counsel. You recognize. Patrick, thank you very much for, for being with us. I, you and I have discussed uh, a little bit about this bill, and I just wanted to, for, for the record, so I, I completely understand the department's intent for this, and we don't want good licensees uh, paying very large sums to, 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 to reimburse in a, in a lawsuit. So we talked a little bit about Section 2, where, where it talks about um, if a licensee appeals, it goes to the appellate level, and the licensee loses, they could be held... Uh, uh, accountable for those court costs. And so I think the only thing that I wanted on the record was, you know, I, my concern was I didn't want it to be a huge burden if a licensee um, felt like they needed to appeal a case. I didn't want it to be a burden to them um, if they felt like they were going to have to pay court. If they lost, they were going to have to pay court costs all the time. And so just for the record, what what is the intent of Section 2? Um, and is it the intent that the licensee always has to pay court costs if they lose that that appeal? Thank you, Representative, for that question. Uh, as you'll look at in Section 2, it says May, so it is not a m mandatory recoupment of our fees or costs at the department. It is permissive. Uh, we don't intend it to be an every time kind of thing, but it, right now this, the state cannot recover on appeal. Um, so we are trying to make it where we can if the court determines that that appeal is completely baseless or something along those lines, and you know, and it would be appropriate, then it would be up to the court to to be able to award that. So not every time, not at all. You recognize the follow-up? So, so it's not intended to be a barrier for appeal? No. Okay. Thank you very much. I appreciate you. 
do we have any questions while we're out of session? Thank you. You're excused. We are back in session. Do we have questions of the sponsor on this bill? If not, the chair will announce for clarity one more time, the amendment that was in your package is not being run. And also per the uh, conversation you just heard, uh, the intent is to provide clarity so that judges will uh, not assume things that the legislature did not say. With that, we're taking a vote on sending House Bill 79 to calendar and rules. All in favor say aye. aye. All opposed nay. Rule moves to calendar and rules. Thank you, Lee. Next up is House Bill 142 by Chairman Terry. Do I have a motion? We have a motion and a second. Sponsor, uh, you're recognized uh, on House Bill 142. Thank you, uh, Chairman and Committee. And um, my understanding is that there may be an amendment on this. Do, do you want me to explain the bill before we get to the amendment? Actually, or? I think we have two amendments. Uh, There's one that's traveling with the bill, 4527. Yes, that we have, but uh, we also show amendment uh, uh, 5539. That is correct. That's by you, sir, and it's not on the bill uh, correct. at the current time. We have a motion on the amendment. Do I have a second? We have a motion and a second. You're clear to explain your amendment, sir. Okay. Uh, that amendment just makes it clear that the members of the General Assembly uh, that are from the House and the Senate that are put on the advisory committee are not voting members. Do we have questions on the amendment? Any objections to the question? Seeing none, we're voting on putting House Amendment 5539 on the bill. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed nay. The amendment is on the bill. And now the chair will turn the gavel over to the vice chair for the next amendment. Chairman Reagan, you are recognized on the amendment. And, and for clarity, give me that drafting code, please. The House, uh, the amendment is 5490, sir. All right. We have a motion and a second. Chairman Reagan, please explain your amendment. This amendment is a simple uh, word out, word in. It changes the word gender to sex. Uh, gender is not defined in our code. And that's the sum total of the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any questions from the committee members? Seeing none. All of those, we do have a motion and a second. All those in favor of adding amendment 5490 onto House Bill 142, signify by saying aye. aye. Any opposition, nay. Amendment goes on. Chairman Reagan, you have the gavel. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. And the sponsor is recognized for closing comments. Right, thank you. Uh, this is the TANF Opportunity Act, which is a collaborative piece of legislation between the administration, DHS, Commissioner Carter, Carter and the TANF Working Group uh, put forth by Lieutenant Governor McNally and Speaker Sexton. Uh, as you're likely aware, DHS receives a yearly recruitment grant of $191 million to go towards TANF, and the state of Tennessee has a mass reserve well over $700 million. Uh, DHS uh, may utilize those funds with more, four main purposes in mind. Number one, to provide assistance to needy families so that children can be cared for in their own homes. Number two, to reduce dependency by promoting job preparation, work, and marriage. Number three, to prevent and reduce the incidence of out-of-wedlock pregnancies. And number four, to encourage the formation and maintenance of two-parent families. Uh, DHS utilizes TANF funds in four main categories to achieve these purposes. Those categories are cash assistance, a reserve, workforce development, and community grants. This bill addresses each of those categories while enhancing protections against fraud and abuse of the TANF, TANF program. Members, you've heard the sponsor's closing comments before I call for a vote. Uh, I'm going to ask legal to roll the, the amendments that were put on this committee, put on in this committee into one to go forward. With that, we're voting on sending House Bill 142 to Finance, Ways, and Means. All in favor? Oh, you have a question? Yeah. You're recognized. More of a comment, really. I guess I'm, I'm going to support the bill, of course. Um, but I would like to see in the future us getting payments directly to families without a, a, without a middleman or something like that. I think the most effective cost-effective and efficient way is to get the money directly to the families. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Without objection, we're voting on sending House Bill 142 to Finance, Ways, and Means. All in favor say aye. aye. All opposed nay. Bill moves out to Finance, Ways, and Means. Thank you, Chairman and Committee.
Next on the agenda, item number three by Representative Williams, motion House Bill 368. We have a motion and a second. Representative Williams, you are recognized. Thank you, Chairman and members. Uh, Chairman, I recognize that you filed a, an amendment uh, which further clarifies the bill. In order to fully discuss it, I'm happy if you want to join your amendment. All right, we will uh, accept the sponsor's recommendation. Uh, Mr. Vice Chairman, would you take the gavel, please? All right, Chairman Reagan, please explain the Amendment 5545. We've got a motion and a second on the amendment. Go ahead, sir. Thank you. This amendment clarifies that records not resulting in charges of delinquency would remain confidential and that a law enforcement officer conducting an investigation from another jurisdiction would be privileged to those confidential records after the fact. With that explanation, uh, I move passage. From committee members, questions for the chairman on this amendment? Seeing none, all those in favor of adding amendment 5545 to House Bill 368 signify by saying aye. aye. Any opposition, nay. Amendment goes on. Chairman Reagan, you have the gavel. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Members of the committee, we've had a request for public testimony. Is the individual here? Please come forward. We are out of session to hear public testimony. Please take a seat. Give us your name and any organization you represent. Uh, hi, I'm Deborah Fisher. I'm executive director of Tennessee Coalition for Open Government. We track public records and open meetings, bills, and laws, and um, and court rulings on those things. And um, on this bill, um, uh, the amendment does uh, actually address one of the issues that we had, which was what we thought was some conflict with um, uh, the juvenile portion of the code that makes law enforcement records of juveniles confidential unless a child is um, transferred to adult court. Um, so this clarifies that one piece. Um, I, if there is an outstanding issue, we do have an outstanding issue on what happens in an incident that involves a minor uh, on school property, such as say a school shooting in the minor. Um, maybe is deceased, so there are no charges filed. And then to those records that um, are, uh, after a law enforcement agency investigates what's hap what happened, are those records then confidential? And right now they wouldn't be, and information about, you know, what happened with that child um, would be um, uh, public. Same thing, and just in terms of the wording of the bill about an incident involving a minor, we aren't exactly sure with hope to get some clarification on what that means if an adult, um, if there's a, a crime by an adult on school property involving a minor. So those are just some questions we had at the bill about the bill that I wanted to bring forward, and I thank you for your time. Members of the committee, you've heard the testimony. Do we have uh, questions of our guest? Seeing none. Thank you, ma'am. You're excused. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, the chair recognizes the sponsor for closing comments. Uh, thank you, Chairman and members. House, this House Bill 368 was brought to me by the legal counsel oh, from. Sorry, wait a minute. We're back in session. Sponsor, I apologize. You're right. No, no, it's fine. House Bill 368 <laughs> was brought to me by the legal counsel for Putnam County School Boards. Recently, there was an instance uh, regarding two juveniles in which some images were traded uh, between the two juveniles. Law enforcement was called, a police record was done, and uh, outside the adjudication in the courts or any criminal charges being uh, brought, the school board realized that those documents could be a matter of open records request. What this bill would do, would it would close those records for juveniles whenever there wasn't a prosecution. The chairman's amendment uh, clarifies that it, in any law enforcement investigation that law enforcement could, in fact, uh, get those documents or those files as it relates to the incident. And so this bill just seeks to protect juveniles. In regards to Ms. Fisher's comments, she, uh, in the instance of a juvenile and adult, there would be criminal charges there. In any criminal case, the, the juvenile's records would always be sealed. Uh, in the instance, the, the other instance of which she uh, alluded to a school shooting, uh, that would be, <coughs> even if there were no charges brought prosecutorily, the only people that could get those would be the three named in your amendment, uh, Chairman Reagan. So. I uh, hope that clears up any uh, concerns you might have. I'm happy to answer any questions you or the committee may have. Uh, 
Chairman Crawford to recognize. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, ju I just wanted to uh, say thank you to the sponsor of this bill. I did hear back from some of my school board members, and um, this is this is a good bill that protects our kids and uh, and our community does nothing to uh, open our communities up to anything. So thank you for uh, taking the time to do this. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Do we have any other questions of the sponsor? Seeing none, without objection, we're voting to send uh, House Bill 368 to calendar and rules. All in favor say, say aye. Aye. All opposed nay. Ayes have it. Bill moves to calendar and rules. Thank you, Chairman and members. Next on our agenda is House Bill 734 by Chairman Smith. Motion. Second. We have a motion and a second. Uh, Representative Smith, you are recognized on House Bill 734. Thank you, Chairman and Committee. This is a drafting code 2783 of House Bill 734. Mr. Chairman, in uh, April 2020, CMS or the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services uh, created waivers for state governments to address the COVID response. And on April the uh, 1st, 2002, in Executive Orders 14 and 15, a designation for temporary nurses' aides were, was created here in the state of Tennessee to address the, the uh, vast shortage of help that was needed in nursing homes as well as for bedside care within a, a home for the elderly. And during that window of time from April the 1st, 2020, until the current window or current date, there are over 1,229 people that have stepped up in the shortage and have taken an online curriculum. They have practiced under this emergency order. This would simply direct the Department of Health, along with the appropriate licensing board, to create emergency rules by July the 1st of this year to make sure that these 1,229 individuals who are gainfully employed right now do not lose the benefit of this uh, uh, didactic information that they've already taken online as well as all the clinical hours and this would help them establish a way for to move into a licensure and with that Mr. Chair Chairman I'll be happy to take questions of the committee. Members you've heard the sponsor's explanation do we have questions? See, the question has been called and without objection we're voting on sending House Bill 734 to calendar and rules all in favor say aye. aye. All opposed nay. Bill moves to calendar and rules. Thank you, Chairman and Committee. Next up is House Bill 612 by Leader Gant. Is he in? We have a motion and a second on the bill. Leader Gant, you're recognized for explanation. Thank you, Chairman uh, and Committee. Uh, what This is a treasurer's bill. Uh, this bill authorizes the state treasurer to inquire with local governments and volunteer fire departments about establishing a length of service award program, which is known as LOSAP. Pursuant to Section 457 of the Internal Revenue Code, based on the results of the inquiry, the treasurer is authorized to establish a LOSAP program. A LOSAP is a type of retirement plan for volunteers providing firefighting and prevention services, emergency medical services, and ambulance services. To be eligible to receive benefits from the LOSAP, an individual must be a bona fide volunteer who receives no compensation for the services and instead receives only reimbursement for reasonable expenses or reasonable benefits and nominal fees customarily paid in connection with the performance of such services. LOSAPs may be defined uh, may be defined contribution plans similar to a 401k or defined benefit plans like like in a pension. A LOSAP is funded by contributions from local governments and or nonprofit entities that utilize the services of eligible volunteers. The volunteers themselves would would not contribute, and the state would not bear the cost of the program. It would be on the local county. Mr. Chairman, I stand ready for any questions. Members, you've heard the sponsor's explanation. Do we have questions of the sponsor on this bill? Seeing none. Oh, I'm sorry. Chairman Crawford, did you have a comment, sir? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I have one question for the sponsor. There's an administration bill that's coming that would pay volunteer firemen for in-service and those type things. 
this bill would do nothing to interfere with that, correct? You recognize? That is correct. Thank you, sir. Do we have other questions of the sponsor? Okay, we're going to vote on sending House Bill 612 to Finance, Ways, and Means. All in favor say aye. aye. All opposed nay. <coughs> Bill moves to Finance, Ways, and Means. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Committee. Next is House Bill 1173 by Chairman Vaughn. Baum, Baum sorry. We have a motion and a second on the bill. Mr. Sponsor, you are recognized to explain your bill. Thank you, Chairman Reagan. Our state's BEP funding formula provides, contains no provisions providing direct funding to LEAs for the construction of new schools. And yet, some of our LEAs are growing very quickly. Some are adding 1,000 or more new students per year. Some are initiating the construction of one new school per year. This is a bill that would provide state, fund, state funding for these LEAs to build new schools or fund other capital projects. It would result in a transfer of funds from our state's general fund outside of the BEP funding formula. In order to be eligible for these funds, an LEA would have to have grown 2% or more over the preceding five-year period. No LEA would be eligible for more than $7 million of funding. There's a relatively complicated funding formula that's in the bill, but ultimately this bill would benefit 35 LEAs across the state. On average, they would receive about $600,000. Happy to answer your questions. Representative Stewart, you're recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. My question is, isn't the BEP the result of litigation, isn't it designed to balance all these needs? My concern is that if you pay certain uh, certain counties money and you don't pay other counties, that you're upsetting the balance and we end up back in court. Have you have you considered that? You recognize, Mr. Sponsor? This is a bill that's designed to address growing LEAs, LEAs that are adding additional schools due to additional students. Now, the funding would operate outside of the BEP funding formula, so it wouldn't change the existing BEP funding formula. My understanding is that the existing formula has four components, one for salaries, one for benefits, one for classrooms, and one for non-classroom items. And in none of those four categories would the funding, would state funding for an LEA change when an LEA makes the decision to, to build a new school. If an LEA decides from not building a new school to making the decision to, to build a new school, their BEP funding from the state does not change. Chair, um, Representative Stewart, follow up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I guess I just wanted to, to have that discussion. I don't really hear you saying that there's been a consideration of the legal implications of adding money to certain counties and not others. My concern about your legislation sounds like it's well intended and I'm for building schools, but I think the way the BEP is supposed to work is there's been this delicate balance created between rural districts, urban districts, suburban districts, all their various needs. And I think when you start adding a lot of money to one group, you may upset that balance and get us back to the sort of litigation that we had at the beginning where you had unequal distribution of money and that's why we have the BEP in the first place. So I guess your bill is clearly well intended. I'm just concerned about the the implications of it. I'm worried you're going to take us down a road that takes us back into court because really I think all of our state funding is supposed to be directed through the BEP, at least for these major components of our education system. Representative Bond, you wish to respond? Maybe I could respond this way. Any LEA would be eligible for this funding. It wouldn't be earmarked for certain districts over others. Conditional on them growing 2% over the preceding five years. That would be the motivation for, or for why they would need to build a new school in the first place. Representative Stewart, last follow-up. Yeah, and, and I guess what's, what I would say is I think if I had a bill that took some quality of my county, and I'm not saying your county is the only county that has growth, although I'm sure it's a big issue having driven through Rutherford County for a Little League baseball games and seen all the development and everything. Um, you know, there are a lot of aspects to any county's education system. And if I had a bill that would have the net effect of, say, giving $10 million to my county, not to other counties, I would love it. But I would be concerned that I would be creating inequalities 
that the BEP is designed to to address. So I think as you go down the road, I think that needs to be probably vetted, perhaps even with an attorney general opinion, because I worry that passing your bill may have the unintended consequences of of undoing the BEP unintentionally. Representative Cochran, you recognize? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Baum, does this create a, an entirely new pool of money, or does it just kind of change how you're allowed to use your, your current allocation of BEP funds? Can you? Mr. Sponsor, you recognize? I think my answer to your question would be it would be a, a new pool of money. This is funding outside of the BEP funding formula. In that sense, the BEP formula wouldn't change. The funding through the formula wouldn't change. This would just be additional state dollars through the state's general fund that would be provided to, to, to certain LEAs with one condition. The condition is they have to have grown 2% over five years. That's the barometer used to determine whether they would need a new school or not. Okay. Thank you very much. Other questions for our sponsor? Seeing none, <clears throat> we are voting on sending House Bill 1173 to finance ways and means. All in favor indicate by saying aye. aye. All opposed by nay. If you wish to be recorded as a no with the clerk, please uh, contact the clerk. Eyes have it. The bill passes to finance ways and means. Thank you all. Next up is House Bill 1114 by Chairman Leatherwood. We have, we have a motion and a second. Uh, Chairman Leatherwood, you are recognized to explain your bill. Before Thank you, you get to that, though, let me point out to the committee members, it is traveling with an amendment. Amendment code is 005378. Is that correct, Mr. Sponsor? That is correct. No action is required in this committee on that. You're recognized for an explanation. Okay. Um, first on the amendment, 5378, it's a combo amendment. Part of it um, brought by the administration to assure that this bill is um, not mandatory at all, but is completely permissive. And the second part of the amendment um, excludes higher education, where many of the higher education institutions were already providing child care, and we weren't trying to change what they were already doing. So that's the amendment, Mr. Chairman. Members, you've heard the explanation by the sponsor. Do we have questions of the sponsor? Okay, seeing none, we're going to vote on sending House Bill 1114 to Finance, Ways, and Means. All in favor, indicate by saying aye. aye. All opposed, nay. Ayes have it. The bill moves out to Finance, Ways, and Means. Thank you. Item number eight is House Bill 1010 by Chairman Hicks. We have a motion and a second, sir. And your bill is traveling unamended. Is that correct? That is correct, sir. You are recognized for an explanation on your bill, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman and committee, House Bill 1010 uh, provides the following. The state treasurer uh, would be authorized to establish a captive insurance company for the purpose of insuring the state's potential losses, exposures, and risks. The captive insurance company would be a separate legal entity administratively attached to the Department of Treasury. The captive insurance company would be subject to the same oversight and regulation by the Department of Commerce and Insurance as a private captive insurance company. The state treasurer shall administer the day-to-day -day operations of the captive, including, but not limited to, contracting with private vendors and professionals upon a delegation from the Board of Claims, and any funds received by the captive insurance company would be invested and reinvested in the name of the company uh, by the state treasurer in accordance with the investment policy established for the captive and in compliance with laws and regulations governing private captive insurance companies. Members, you've heard the explanation offered by the sponsor. Do we have questions of members? We're, we are voting on sending House Bill 1010 to Finance, Ways, and Means. All in favor, indicate by saying aye. aye. All opposed, nay. If you wish to be recorded as nay, be recorded by the clerk. Ayes have it. House Bill 1010 moves out to Finance, Ways, and Means. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Item number nine on our agenda, House Bill 455 by Representative Thompson. We have a motion and a second. Thank you, sponsor. Uh, your bill is to be amended, but we'll we'll get your explanation on it first before we, unless you want an amendment on it now. Uh, frankly, I wasn't aware of an amendment. So. Let me help you out then, okay. Mr. Vice Chair. You are recognized. 
Thank you, Chairman Reagan. Uh, you are recognized on Amendment 5491, sir. Thank you. Members, what this amendment does is add the compact to the sunset cycle and establishes a sunset date of June 30th, 2023. Members, can I get a motion and a second on this? We do have the motion and the second. Any comments, questions for Chairman Reagan? Seeing none, all those in favor of adding Amendment 5491 to House Bill 455 signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed, nay. Amendment goes on. Chairman Reagan, the gavel is yours. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Now, sponsor, you've heard the amendments you didn't know was coming. <laughs> <laughs> you are recognized to explain your bill as amended. Th thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm fine with the amendment, too. Um, the, this is um, a bill that, to include Tennessee in the Psychology Interjurisdictional Compact, or SIPACT, as it's commonly known. Um, it's a compact that's designed to achieve certain benefits, including to increase public access to professional psychological services by allowing telepsychological practice across state lines, as well as temporary in-person face-to-face services in, into a state where the psychologist is not licensed to practice psychology. Uh, it's to enhance uh, the state's ability to protect the public's health and safety, especially client-patient safety, to encourage the cooperation of compact states in the area of psychology licensure and regulation, uh, to facilitate the exchange of information between compact states regarding uh, licensure, adverse actions, and disciplinary history, uh, to promote comp uh, compliance with the laws governing psychological practice in each compact state, and to invest all compact states with the authority to hold a uh, licensed psychologist accountable through the mutual recognition of compact state licensures. Um, this was initially brought to uh, the Veterans Caucus uh, by the Department of Defense. And um, of course, it's, it's um, important for military families who are in their um, uh, who are transitioning and often moving to new states to uh, be able to use the um, the um, uh, ease of transferring license and temporary license um, uh, ability to use um, um, out-of-state licenses. Um, it's um, of course it's. Um, it's endorsed by the Veterans Caucus, but it's it's uh, something that will be a benefit to all Tennesseans as far as psychological services. Um, Tennessee already is uh, has entered similar compacts that affect nurses, EMTs, and physical therapists. Um, at this point, 15 states have uh, entered the compact, including uh, four border states of Tennessee. And there are 15 additional states who have active legislation at the present time. Um, the Board of Examiners and Psychology have voted to endorse this legislation. Uh, and the Senate has uh, already passed this uh, legislation with no opposition. Members, you've heard the explanation of the bill, all except the part about the Senate. Uh, are there... We have uh, Chairman Crawford, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I just got two brief questions, I think. Sure. One is you made the statement there about uh, being able to practice without a license. Can you explain that a little more? Well, they're, they're able to. Um, that, that's um, I probably didn't. That's not the, the best wording, but uh, they can temporarily for a, a max of 30 days practice in, an, in a, another compact state. In other words, uh, Tennessee adopts this. Uh, for instance, Virginia is in this compact now. So when moving uh, to Tennessee from Virginia can um, practice for 30 days um, until they, um, in, 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 uh, in the meantime, it gives them time to get a Tennessee license. I, and let me clarify that if, if I'm correct. They're still licensed in the state, which is also part of the compact, as licensed in Virginia, just That's not correct. in Tennessee. Okay, thank you. 
Chairman Crawford, you're recognized for a second question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I guess the other question, that, that kind of halfway answered that. You said there was other organizations that were doing this with nursing and some other things. Yeah. Can can you explain, is it being handled the same way that they have 30 days to receive a Tennessee license? Uh, how is, can you, can you explain who's doing that and how they're doing it? Well, frankly, I cannot give the, that, ex, that, um, answer that question as far as how long they have temporary license. But thank you, Mr. Chairman. Do we have other questions of our sponsor? Seeing now we do have a request for public testimony. We're going out of session. Oh, no, I'm sorry, excuse me. Uh, I think Representative Calfee had a question before we got to say we're back in session. Uh, well, Chairman really Calfee. just a statement uh, to my friend from Shelby County. An old man told me a long time ago, when you've got the horse sold, quit talking. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, now we're out of session. And the name that I have for public testimony, I believe, is Mr. Mark Green. Is Mr. Green here? Nope. Changing plans there. Okay, we're back in session. All right, with the bill, the bill is before us. We are voting to send House Bill 455 to Finance, Ways, and Means. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed, nay. No. Bill moves out. The ayes have it. If you wish to be recorded as a no, talk to the clerk. Thank you, Mr. Sponsor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman Committee. Members, we're on item number 10, House Bill 533 by Chairman Weaver. We have a motion and a second. Uh, members, for your information, it is traveling with an amendment. The amendment number is 004094. Because it is already on the bill, we do not need to take action on it in this committee. Chairman Weaver, you are recognized for an explanation of your bill, 533. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Thank you, members. Um, as many of you know, in your district, we are all having, <clears throat> pardon me, struggle with uh, the shortage of teachers. And this bill uh, seeks to take care of that. Um, in, re in number one, in recruitment and retention of professional teachers uh, into your district, House Bill 533 will also seek to solve, to remove difficult process in placing a proven qualified educator in the classroom and also by issuing a license that is equivalent to the license that the teacher possesses in another state. I, I was This was brought to my attention in my district in Sumner County when I visit my schools every other year. A principal there was telling me that they were really wanting to get a teacher from, from Kentucky to move, and she wanted to come teach in the elementary school. And I was not aware of the speed bumps and the roadblocks to get quality teachers who are capable to come into our classroom and teach our kids. And so if you're a pro in Kentucky, you should be a pro in Tennessee. And uh, the amendment, I'll just kind of go uh, briefly through the outline of the bill. It will probably answer some questions uh, if, you if you have some later. But section one allows out-of-state educators that possess the equivalent of a Tennessee professional teacher's license in their current state to re receive a Tennessee professional level teaching license without being required to take an assessment or receive certain evaluation scores. Additionally, Section 1 includes specific language that supports military spouses seeking re uh, reciprocal licensure in Tennessee. Action 1 only applies to licensure applications effective on or after July 1, 2021 evaluation score within the last two years to replace these missing evaluation scores with either 1, the most recent evaluation score that is available, or 2, a recommendation from the Director of Schools regarding the educator's evaluation score. And Section 2 is effective upon becoming law. Section 3 gives the State Board of Education the authority to promulgate rules for this legislation, and sec Section 3 is effective on becoming law. And we really need to get this uh, getter done and get this bill going because we've got a lot of teachers that could be filling in the vacancies that we have across our state, and there's a lot of those. So if you have any other questions, I'll be glad to answer them. Representative, uh, pardon me, Leader Dixie, you're recognized. I, I wanted to thank... Uh, Representative Weaver for bringing this. Uh, this is long overdue. This is going to help out not only your LEAs, but every LEA across the state. Amen. We're all having this problem. So I'm, I'm proud to support this bill and hopefully be a co-sponsor. So thank you. 
I believe you are, and I'm honored to have you. <laughs> uh, stand by. We have another. We have another question here. Uh, Representative Johnson, you're recognized. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. We definitely are, are approaching a serious teacher crisis uh, shortage, and and I've ha I have some concerns from the teacher prep program at University of Tennessee at Knoxville, which is the program I attended, and what their concerns are are a lot of these other states, even for a professional license, they had no um, educator prep program. There's something called the American board that some states accept, and it's basically watching YouTube videos and becoming a teacher. And um, and it's paying $2,000. And so also the with TFA, they have a five-week teacher training program. So their concern is, yes, we need teachers, but is, is there any way to put in here something like they needed a, a certain number of hours with an educator preparation program? Because um, there are several um, states that, I mean, quite a few states that have <coughs> situations where people can become a teacher without ever going, having any hours from an EPP. And, and that is very concerning. Chairman Weaver, you're recognized. Um, well, immediately I was thinking about our local LEAs and um, I was talking about this bill with my school director in my district. And the LEAs are pretty keen on knowing, can this teacher, you know, teach in front of our kids in our district. And I think they pretty much, I like to give them, I like to give them the benefit of the doubt that they would know what teacher to pull from to put into their, into their classroom because they've been working on, on the relationship. Like the principal was also in my district with a shortage teacher that I mean with the, the lack of teachers in Sumner County from Kentucky and so they had been working on a relationship. They've been knowing that this is the teacher they want. This is the, the one that would be ideal for this situation. And so I just think our LEAs will be able to, to pick that out. You're recognized for follow-up, Representative Johnson. That's an unusual situation. Typically, when a teacher comes in from another state, they just come in and apply. And so um, I, I just want to bring the attention forward. I mean, like, I love part two of this bill. And <laughs> so, but it's, it's very concerning to me that we will be giving professional license to people who would not have. Yeah, and then to your point, I mean, other states don't do things like we do in Tennessee, and I understand that. Um, but I, I, I would just, uh, I would like to give the LEAs the, I guess the buck stops there with them. And if it's not going to work out, there'll be another teacher. <laughs> or not. <laughs> or not. <laughs> but this bill seeks to do one, one thing, and that's get rid of the bumps in the road in our state that prohibit good teachers from coming. If they're qualified and they're a professional in that state, then they should have you know, the opportunity to come here and show themselves to be true as well. Further questions? Seeing none, we're voting on sending House Bill 533 to calendar and rules. All in favor, indicate by saying aye. All opposed by nay. If you wish to be recorded, no, see the clerk. Ayes have it. The bill passes out to calendar and rules. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Mayor. Item 11 has been dealt with. We are now on item 12, House Bill 851 by Chairman Crawford. Chairman Crawford. Mr. Chairman, may I present from my seat? Second. Yes, please. Thank you. This is House Bill 851. This deals with uh, personal information. Um, apparently, we've had a problem in the country as well as in Tennessee where people have had fraudulent liens placed against their homes, their businesses, farms, and other things. And the Registers of Deeds Association brought this bill to me, and they have a software package that they're putting out throughout the whole state that will allow people to register and uh, if anybody puts a lien on your property, it will alert you. Whether it's a legal lien or whether it's an illegal lien, it will make you aware. And what I'm trying to do with this bill, it doesn't do anything. All that's going in place, but my bill would protect the information that you put into the system, your name, address, uh, social security number, phone number, that it would protect it from being a personal information request. Members, you've heard an explanation of the bill. Do we have questions of the sponsor? 
Okay, seeing none, and without objection, we are voting on sending House Bill 851 to calendar and rules. All in favor say aye. aye. All opposed nay. Bill moves out to calendar and rules. Next on our item list is item number 13, House Bill 973 by Chairman, or, I mean, Leader Dixie. We have a motion and a second. And for explanation, members, you will note that this bill is traveling with an amendment. The amendment number is 004269. It has already been adopted. No action is required in this committee. Uh, Mr. Sponsor, you are recognized for explanation on your bill. Okay. Well, this this uh, amendment, it rolled everything into one that we've had before, so it makes it a little cleaner. Um, so this bill, basically, uh, it directs local school boards to develop a policy that sets clear the enrollment criteria from 7th to 12th grade advanced courses in science, English, uh, language, arts, and math. And advanced courses may include advanced placement, honors courses, but each district will be diff will be different. Offerings will be slightly different depending on what they offer there. So it's totally dependent upon the FBA, I mean LEA. The enrollment cr criteria will be determined by an individual local policy, but it must consider the TCAP scores, the students' grades in science, English, and math. Um, the the lo local enrollment Criteria will also include other factors that a district or a public charter school deems important, such as a student's career inter interest, a teacher's recommendation, or other, stu other student self-nomination. So this bill will help level the playing field and give other students an opportunity um, in order to have to get into advanced course play advanced courses. It will kind of it will level the playing field, and it will give many many students an opportunity. Um, to enroll in this, but to have, take advantage of this and hopefully get our college enrollment up and give them career opportunities as they move forward. With that, Mr. Chairman, I will stand to answer any questions. Members, you've heard an explanation of the bill. Do we have questions of the sponsor? Chairman Crawford, you're recognized. Sorry, Mr. Chairman, I hate to keep uh, interrupting, but uh, I just got one question on this. Uh, Mr. Sponsor, does this have anything to do, will it regulate any of the supplemental information, supplemental uh, uses of the teachers in the classroom? No, Dixie, have, you this not, thank you, sir. I'm sorry. It does not address that. Uh, with questions been called, seeing no further questions, we are voting on sending House Bill uh, 973 to calendar and rules. All in favor, indicate by saying aye. aye. All opposed, nay. Bill moves to calendar and rules. Next on our agenda is item number 14, House Bill 317 by, well, let's see, I guess I need to pass this off. Yes. Yes, truly. Uh, Mr. Vice Chair, you are recognized. Thank you, Chairman Reagan. Chairman Reagan, you are recognized on House Bill 317. Did I hear a motion? And a second. Chairman Reagan, please uh, present your bill. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, this uh, this bill is extending the Department of Children's Services uh, to June 2023, and there is an amendment on the bill. The amendment number is 00542, pardon me, 5492. 5492. We've got a motion and a second on the amendment. We do have the motion. We do have the second. Uh, you want to get me? Oh, okay. Discussion on the amendment, uh, Representative Stewart. Whoa. Wait a minute, I need to present the amendment before you give me a question. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Okay, Mr. there you go. Uh, this amendment requires the Department of Children's Services to report back to Government Operations Joint Subcommittee on Education, Health, and General Welfare not later than December 31st, 2021, to update the committee on the progress of the findings in their 2020 performance audit. With that, I move passage. Representative Stewart. Questions for the chairman? Uh, thank you. Um, so what we're saying is we're giving them two years, but they have to come back in one and explain these audit findings. Is that That's correct, sir. Work? Is the department here to? Yes, they are. Okay. It, further, uh, Representative Stewart. I'd like question. to hear from the department about the audit findings. Okay. I think, Chairman Crawford, did you have a question on this? No, my question is on the bill, Okay, <laughs> thank you. So, Chairman Reagan, you want to go out of session to hear? Uh, so, at this time, we will. Okay, you guys are confusing me. Yeah, Representative Stewart, I'm fixing to go to recess. I'm at fault because I asked a question. I want to ask about. I don't know. I think we 
figure some money ahead and just push the amendment onto the bill and then go forward. I didn't mean to get things off. Okay. Back on the amendment. All those in favor of adding amendment 5492 to House Bill 317 state by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, nay. The amendment goes on. At this time, we will go out of session and hear from, well, I guess it's Department of Children's Services. I think it's, it's Commissioner Nichols. So we're, we're out. Please come forward to it and check the light on your microphone. Make sure that it's red and introduce yourselves for the record. If you so desire, please remove your face mask. Check check your microphone, please. What about now? There you go. Better? Thank I you. Like, I saw red. Um, I'm Jennifer Nichols, Commissioner of the Department of DCS. I'm Jennifer Donalds, Chief of Staff at DCS. Representative, may, yes, please may I continue. Um, thank you, Chairman Reagan. I've got a a suggestion from the chairman that we try and limit this to five minutes. That is correct. So there's Thank plenty you. of time for questions. And Ms. Donalds is going to run a stopwatch, but I'm not going to push it till I get to start. <laughs> uh, I want to thank you for allowing us to appear today. We took our the findings in December uh, very, very seriously. And at that time announced um, the correct faction that we had already taken, many of which today uh, are either underway or already complete. And I look forward to going through those uh, with you. I will lump some of the findings together if they relate to a particular division within the department just for time's sake. Um, so as for finding number one, I'm going to combine that with finding number six as both of those relate to our juvenile justice division. Uh, finding number one um, was primarily related to tracking face-to-face -face contacts with our youth um, and it has been corrected by establishing new protocol for supervisors to actually track case manager face-to-face -face contacts. Um, all JJ staff has been trained. The new protocols were already written. They've been put, in, put into the supervisor's performance review plan. And I'm happy to report, should you have questions, that our face-to-face uh, -face visits have skyrocketed just with that very small uh, tweak. There was also a concern that our electronic monitoring unit or was not uh, where it should be. Um, actually, we didn't have a unit, so we created one last October before our hearing, and they've all been trained, and it is working beautifully. That's for the youth that are on a, a monitor. Um, number six, related to PREA compliance. It was concerned to many of you in December, and it was that of the four years, we missed one of the years, one year reporting out on our um, annual staffing plan. So what we did on that one is put it into policy that we named the person by title that is responsible for doing that report. We said the report had to be complete by March the 31st of each year. There's an internal control to make sure that happens. And this year it was completed in February. Finding number two is a two-part HR finding, um, mainly related to whether or not we were maintaining accurate and complete list of volunteers and the fact that we did not perform according to the Comptroller's office and maintain background checks on some employees and volunteers. Of course, that is a huge concern, but I, I do want to reiterate, as we reported in December, this was not a lack of background checks. We did indeed perform background checks using the TBI slash FBI system of NCIC. It was some additional background checks that we the DCS had policies about saying we wanted to do these extra ones that it, at times was lacking. Uh, that said, even though we did have the NCIC, we have completely gone back and are in the process of auditing, have finished some of those audits, every single employee and volunteer to make sure that uh, those background checks are where they should be. And of course, with new volunteers and new employees, the policies we put in place um, obviously included this new, so we didn't have a problem with those. Um, 
finding number three is is falls into our office of child safety division and it was truly the the comptroller's office said that we had improved said that particular division had a weakness and delay in moving some things through the the investigative process and documenting them in TFAX. We did the same. Ma'am, can you pull your mic a little closer, please? We're having difficulty hearing. We did the same thing with OCS in terms of developing performance measures and tools. And our, this is one that we are in the process of doing. It's not complete. The process, I mean, the, the tools are in place, but we have not um, fully implemented them to see the results that we hope to have by our June check-in with the comptroller. Um, I'm going to combine finding four, five, seven, and eight. All of those fall under the CQI or Continuous Quality Improvement Division, excuse me, of the department. And for the most part, relate to our monitoring and documenting of work by our um, network providers, as well as the juvenile detention centers. We don't own and run those, but we do contract with about half of the detention centers in the state. And we, of course, have uh, dozens of providers. And in each of those, we have implemented every single one of those. We've implemented steps to correct each of those monitoring problems, um, including going to Vanderbilt and ask, having Vanderbilt quickly build us out um, a mechanism in our reporting that, I mean, reporting uh, software that will make uh, certain fields be required. So when you're documenting, you can't go to the next step uh, to correct these problems. Um, one other one what dealt with, uh oh, five minutes. I got, uh, can I finish? I'm almost. <laughs> yeah, wrap it up for us. Yes, please. sir. Um, and so finding number nine and 10 are together as well. And those are IT, STS issues. In the first one, um, we are working with STS to correct um, an internal control that sir, had a risk of allowing unauthorized access to sensitive data. I will say it was not just our department when the comptroller's office identified this. So they're working across the board to, to fix that issue. And number 10, um, Decade ago, we began um, a fiscal enhancement to our data system, and at all times we have used that data system. It works. We had workarounds. We were not using another one, and this fiscal enhancement is set to roll out in a couple of weeks. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Representative Stewart. Thank you, Commissioner, for coming. Um, here's my Main question, I looked at the audit report, and of course there are multiple problematic findings. What I don't understand is how come when you look in the audit report, the auditor's comments seem to repeatedly say that you're not providing evidence to respond to their issues. I'll give you just two examples because we've got a lot of people on the committee, they may have their own questions. But with finding one, which was about the lack of consistent documentation of supervisory review of family service workers probation. You give a lengthy explanation. The auditor's comment on page 23 of the audit report is management did not provide evidence to support their statements as to which child contacts were undocumented versus missed. And then you, so these are just two examples of a multitude. If you look at finding four, Management did not have sufficient monitoring process to document and analyze the provider agencies who performed all required background checks. So now we're talking about putting children at risk of potential criminal acts. Uh, you go through all the various discussions and then uh, the, the, on page 60, the audit report says management did not provide us a response for each type of problem we noted. We provided additional comments when necessary. My question is, how come this report has so many instances where the auditors from the comptroller's office are still saying after all is said and done, after they've sat down with you and gone through all these concerns, that your office has not produced the information they're looking for? Why is that throughout this entire report? Yes, Sam, I'd like to address finding number one. That's the first one that you I'd brought. like to know more generally, if you wouldn't mind, Commissioner, because it seems like this suggests a culture of lack of responsiveness and failure. And so I'm trying to figure out 
So when we don't get back here in 2021 and have the same problems, what is hap- why I've never seen an audit report like this, frankly, where repeatedly it says management didn't respond to the auditors. What's the issue? I, I guess what I was going to try and say is, is give you an example that I think it can be used to generally, uh, which is what I think you want. I'm going to do that by addressing finding number one. In that instance, this is the one that I started off with today saying that there was a lack of evidence about our case managers' um, face-to-face contacts with youth. So we asked them, go through, what's the deal? If, and I said in December, we're in a culture, if it's not documented, it didn't happen. So we have case managers that will swear that they made visits, face-to-face visits, and yet we don't have the evidence. You don't have it, it didn't happen. I mean, that that's the way it, it ends up in, a, in an audit report, and I, I respect that. So what we did is what I said. We put in corrective measures, we put in new tools, and we have gone from, in all four categories, like 50, 60, 70% of the face-to-faces being done to the lowest one being 91.8%, just as a result of putting in new policies. And I think I had a conversation with a comp tur- Troller Wilson, the day before this was released publicly, and what he said to me was, Commissioner, you have a documentation problem. You don't have a performance problem so much as you have a documentation problem. And I took what he said to heart because I believed it. And so what we are doing now across the board, and I can tell you, sir, this isn't a culture problem because if it was a culture problem, that would come from me. And you're not going to find that from me. You're not going to hear from me that we don't care and that we don't answer. But what happens is if it's not documented, it didn't happen, and we couldn't give it to them. Representative Stewart, follow-up question, comment? And I know there are a lot of members. I won't belabor the point. Uh, Would you agree that if you come back, we should be able to expect, as the people's elected representatives, that auditors will be confirming that you provided the information they asked for to address all of these findings? Well, we will be reporting back to them in June. Okay, because we, we have a six month report that we, a corrective action plan that we have to show them how we've corrected it. What I would like to do is make sure you get a copy of that in June so you don't have to wait till we come back. That we would appreciate that, just sending that to the chair. That's how certain I am about the corrective action. All right, thank, thank you. you. Right. Uh, Representative Calfee, I've got you next on the. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yes, ma'am, you, you've already said what I was going to say. I conducted nuclear quality audits for nearly 40 years. If it's not documented, it never happened. I'm glad to hear you say that. Now, I've got a question that you're talking about the face to face. Do you think there's any possibility that some reason you didn't have some of this documentation? that the caseworkers actually didn't go see, do the face-to-face. They just uh, wrote down that they did. Well, in in fact, they didn't write down that they did. And I think it's a combination of, I think we had case managers not making, because like in some, depending on the level of service, you had to make, you know, three and 30 days. And then, you know, they're on out. So I know, I would not stand here, sir, and tell you that I believed every single one of them did it. I believe our tracking mechanisms weren't what they should. I believe that the system was too complicated. I do believe that some of them went and made the visits and didn't write them down because they were in a hurry or thought they'd do it tomorrow and didn't. Um, So I believe it's a combination. But now I can tell you of the four areas, one area between October of 2016 and July 2020, 56%. 56%. That's how uh, three face-to-face visits within the first 30 days. That's gone up since our policy changed to 91.8%. Um, probation, that was a wholly different section. We were at 71% between 2016 and 2020. We're now at 95.4%. And there's two more sections that have that big of a leap. All it took was getting in there and putting the controls in there and people understanding you're going to make them and you're going to document them. Representative Calfee, follow up? Yes, sir. Thank you, ma'am. I'm glad to hear that. And on a little more positive note, there was a young lady uh, two weeks ago, this past Friday, overdosed, 
had her 17 month old child with her and we went to the DCS in Kingston and we we had some great help there uh, preparing us to file for joint, for emergency custody of this child which we kept for several days and then maybe that maybe the grandparents are going to keep it and maybe not but uh, we sure had some good help and I can't remember the lady's name there I want to say it was Lisa I'm going to look it up and I appreciate but, uh, you telling me I don't don't quote me on the name but I, I'm telling you we couldn't have been treated any more nice than we were down there so we may still end up with this child which is a little bit tough at our age, but uh, we're going to do what we need to do. And and uh, pass that on if you would. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, thank you. Representative Johnson, questions, comments? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and, and we've talked about, have you increased the number of caseworkers since the, the we last met with the findings? I, I have not. Um, and, and thank you for coming to see us and allowing us to talk about it. As you pointed out, um, you asked me, do you need more? And I said, <laughs> what's enough? We always need more, of course. And we have not uh, increased the number since you and I visited. And, and I didn't think so, but I wanted to make sure yes, before m my next comment, which is, um, you know, a lot of that reporting, it, it happened, it didn't get reported. And I know from talking to so many caseworkers that they are maxed out in their caseloads. And, and honestly, when you go from 50 to 90 percent, I'm seriously concerned about caseworkers' mental health at this point. Um, you know, the reality is when you stretch people so thin, turnover is, has to be incredible. What's the turnover rate like in the department? A turnover rate uh, is a problem. Thank you for bringing it up. It, it, it's, a, it's a big problem. In fact, when I was here in December, um, we were talking about wilder turnover, and I gave a number that was incorrect have since found out and contacted Chairman Reagan um, that our HR was using a wrong, a wrong formula. And even Wilder by itself was 18%. And I think case manager overall is, I know, but what's over case managers? She, we're, we're getting it. Bottom line is uh, it's high. I, be, mm -hmm. I believe that it's close to 18%, like 17 or 18, but we'll get it exactly for you. But, Thank you. Representative, do you have a follow-up question, comment? Yeah, real quick. Please go ahead. Um, everyone, you know, all the caseworkers that I've ever worked with, talked to, you know, they're not slacking. They're doing their job and they're working really hard for low pay and a really intense and uh, difficult job. So I just say that we have to do everything we can to increase the number of caseworkers and also, you know, and to decrease that turn uh, turnover, which is such, um, it's not good with the population that they're working with. Thank you for acknowledging that because we've been told that every single time we have a case manager leave, it delays permanency for the children on their on their caseload by six months. That that's how bad it is. And last on my list, Representative Littleton, questions for the commissioner. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you guys for being here. And we talked about this in my office about the uh, the background checks. I think that was one of my, my greatest concerns. If you could go back over that, because um, it's just when you're letting people out there without the background check, it's dangerous, to, or it could be dangerous to all of us. So if you could go back over, I know you brought it up, but if you could go back over that a little bit more intense, yes, please. Yes, ma'am. All right, so the... I want to reiterate, though, that all employees and volunteers do complete fingerprint and background, criminal background checks conducted by TBI and FBI. That wasn't the problem. Um, this particular finding centered on the department policy, which required additional background checks and, and registry checking. And when the comptroller's office went back and checked all of those for the for the employees they identified, there was not one employee or one volunteer that wouldn't have been hired or allowed to volunteer as a result of the policies, I mean, as a result of the registries and the extra background checks because we had done the TBI and FBI. And I say that just to alleviate some fears. That said, we're not stopping there. So we, 
a new HR policy was created that requires all pre-hire background checks uh, out there in the region, so across the state, to now be submitted to central office. And that employee is not going to be put into Edison until the person running that this new program under this new policy has confirmed that every single I has been dotted and T has been crossed. We're also doing that for every single volunteer. Now, these volunteers, for the most part, are these wonderful people that, that work at Isaiah House and some of the other type facilities, but we are also going to make sure that every volunteer, once they apply, comes to central office, their paperwork, and is checked before they are certified. So before they can walk in the door as a DCS volunteer. Um, and thank you for, for asking, Representative Littleton. We appreciate it. You can't slack on it. If and, and I'm not suggesting that the FBI's process is slacking. We did that. But our department wanted these additional checks for a reason. And then we're going to make sure they happen. Thank you. Commissioner Chairman Reagan. Questions, thank, comments? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I want to thank the department for being here today. <clears throat> and also as a reminder to the committee, they will be reporting back to the uh, comptroller on the comptroller findings in June. And they'll also, based on the amendment that was put on the bill, uh, be back here in December of 2021 or before. Uh, and with that, thank you for being here. Ms. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, Chairman. Representative Crawford. Question or comment? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it's good to hear of all the strides that's being made and the improvements that's being made, but I want to go back to uh, my fellow representative here from Davidson County, and uh, the big thing that I'm going to be looking for is to make sure you guys are providing the information and being compliant with the comptroller. That, that means a lot. When you have nine or ten findings, that really raises concerns with us. And then not to be compliant with the comptroller is very concerning. So I ask you to please uh, do your best to comply with that and provide them with the information. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. With that, any further questions, comments? Chairman Reagan. You are uh, Reagan. Just a correction. The June report is, is actually a written document that's given to us as opposed to testimony. So I would Got be unclear on that. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Chairman. Any further questions, comments? Seeing none. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you for being with us today. We are now back in session. Any further discussion on the bill? Seeing none. Are we ready to vote? We've got the motion. We've got the second. All those in favor of sending House Bill 317 to calendar and rules signify by saying aye. aye. Any opposition? Nay. Bill moves out to calendar and rules. And have the clerks take your vote if you're in opposition. Next on our calendar is item number 15, House Bill 255, the second look commission. Chairman Reagan, you are recognized on House Bill 255. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. This is a simple a bill. It just extends the, thank you for the and motion. A second. Uh, extends the second look commission to 2025. They came through the uh, joint committees uh, with, with no problems. Any questions from the members? Seeing none, all those in favor of sending House Bill 255 to calendar and rules? I'm sorry, I shall back up. Representative Johnson. Um, not a question really, but a, a concern that I remember when they were here, they talked about hundreds of um, cases to look at, and each year they got through 12. If there's any way possible, I sure would like to see the commission get through more than 12 cases per year. Thank you. Uh, Representative Littleton. Thank you, Chairman. I serve on that committee. And we do meet quarterly, and there's no way meeting quarterly that you can do that because it takes us the, the whole morning, sometimes into the afternoon. They're brutal cases. They're hard to go over. But we go through them with a fine-tooth comb to try and find legislation that will help protect our children. So it's a great committee, but there's no way to meet in quarterly that we could do any different. Representative Johnson, last comment? Yes, thanks. They, I did speak with the committee. Um, commissioner, and that she told me that it was very involved, and I appreciate that. But, um, you know, I, I don't know how that would work, but I would sure like to see us get through more than 12 a year. Okay, thank you thank for your you. comments. Any further questions, comments on the bill? Seeing none. All those in favor of sending House Bill 255 to calendar and rules signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposition, nay. Bill moves on to calendar and rules. 
Next on our calendar, item number 16, House Bill 729, State Energy Policy Council. Chairman Reagan, we've got a motion and a second. And we've got a the question has been called on the bill. All those in favor of sending House Bill 729 to finance ways and means signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposition? Nay. <clears throat> Moves on to finance ways and means. Item number 17, House Bill 321, nice. Corn Promotion Board. We do have a motion and a second. And the question has been called. All those in favor of sending House Bill 321 to calendar rule signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposition? Nay. Bill moves on to calendar and rules. Item number 18 on the calendar. House Bill 566 UAPA rules. We do have a motion. We do have a second. Mr. Chairman, you're recognized on the bill. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I believe that uh, there is a House amendment on this bill. Uh, it's amendment number 005439. Is it 39 or 93, sir? I'm sorry, 93. Okay, uh, we do have a motion and a second on the amendment 5493. And this, this amendment makes the bill, sir. And with that, all in favor of putting the amendment 5493 on House Bill 566, signify by saying aye. aye. Any opposition, nay. Amendment goes on. Chairman Reagan, you, uh, the question has been called on the bill. Without any opposition, we will, uh, all those in favor of adding amendment, or I'm sorry, all those in, in favor, turn the page. Okay, all those in favor of sending House Bill 566 to calendar and rules signify by saying aye. aye. Any opposition, nay. Bill moves on to calendar and rules. This completes the calendar. Chairman Reagan, you are recognized, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Vice Chair. Members, we have completed our calendar as a reminder March 29th, which is next week, there will be a joint meeting, committee meeting, and it's being chaired by the Senate this go around. Uh, please make sure that you're available for that one. <laughs> but there's a motion to adjourn. All those in favor, we're adjourned.